want to address an issue today. And I want to introduce it to you first, okay? And so I just want you to listen to what this issue does to us. It steals your sleep. It saps and drains your energy. It dominates your thoughts. It robs your joy. And it chokes your faith. How many of you want to get that out of your life? Anything that's doing that to you? I want to read Philippians 4 verse 6, but just the first four words. I love it when God just confirms his word throughout the service. And it says, be anxious for nothing. In the New Living Translation, it says, don't worry about anything. In other words, this scripture is making it clear that there's no topic, there is no issue, there is nothing in our lives that warrants our worry. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, it does not warrant your worry. Listen to Matthew 6, 25 in the Amplified. Matthew 6, 25 in the Amplified. It says, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious and worried about your life. You know, back then, it was about what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat. Most of you don't have to worry Thank God. If you do, well, that is still for you. But back then, the biggest worries were like, what are we going to eat next? What am I going to wear? But we have different types of issues in our lives often. How am I going to pay that bill? How are things going to work out with that family member? How are things going to turn around at work? And Scripture says here, stop. Just point at yourself and say, stop. stop. Because it says, stop being perpetually uneasy. Now, I just want to define worry for you. Concerned. You see, we've got to eradicate some of these words out of our vocabulary because the Bible says that what we say, we get. It says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And, and what we say affects how we feel, what we think, how we live. And so, you know, I'm really concerned about this. I'm really concerned about that. Oh, no, I don't have an issue with worry. Oh, no, anxiety isn't one of my issues. No, no, no. But I'm really concerned about that. I'm a bit troubled about the other. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about how this is going to turn out. You see, it's concerned, troubled, disquieted uneasy. In the literal Greek, I want you to hear this, it means split. In other words, the reason it's called split is it's one of the greatest distractions in our lives. Anytime you are thinking a thought about worry, you're thinking a thought that you shouldn't be thinking, which is distracting you from what you should be thinking. Split distracted. So this is a really serious issue that I think we sometimes minimize, especially if you're one of those people that doesn't have a big issue with worry. Certain families, it's almost like something that just runs in families. And my husband really, really, really had to conquer worry in a big way. It was just part of his, you know, he inherited it almost, but he conquered it. And then I watched in our children, and my son was more like me, where worry wasn't a perpetual issue, but my daughter has to constantly make choices that she's not going to allow worry to dominate. So for some people, it's a big issue. How many in your family or for you, it's been a perpetual issue? Just lift up your hand. Right. And everyone else, it's not 
one of those constant issues. But let me tell you, it comes in so many disguises. It dresses up, cross dresses. <laughs> I'm telling you, and it has an aim in our lives. You know, what does it say in 2 Timothy 2 4? How many of you, you were really impacted by Pastor P's message last Sunday at the 11 o'clock? How many of you have listened to it again since then? I have. I mean, my, my dear friend Larissa arrived from Uganda. The first thing I said is sit down and listen to this message. I mean, she'd only been on in London for a few hours and I was already playing of a message. If you have not yet heard last Sunday's message at the 11, just lift up your hand. If this is your church, if you're a heart, please listen. Will you do that? Will you get hold of it? It was an awesome word that is still speaking to me. And when I listen to it, uh, you know, each time you listen to something, you'll hear something different that God wants to challenge in you. And, I, you know, one of the things, sorry, if you haven't heard it, you're just going to have to go there. But if only my husband had chosen someone different as his example than Prempe. Because, you know what? He set the bar high. And I thank God for that. I want a high bar. Anyone else want a high bar in your life? Anyone else want to really please God? And so please keep listening to that word. But I mention that because it says in 2 Timothy 2, 4, no soldier. It says no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Well, we have to live life. We need food. We need drink. We need, we need things, don't we? How many of you need stuff? The thing that means that we're entangled is when something has become a difficulty in our life. It's when something is starting to pull our attention, our thoughts. It's when our emotions are now all perturbed in relation to it. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And you see, that verse basically says that when we get entangled in our lives, we can't please God. How many of you want to please God? Wave at me if you're saying, I want to please my daddy God. Me too. And so you see, there are things that we need to just have a short fuse about in our own lives, have a zero tolerance. And um, anxiety, worry is one of them. And so I want to look at how we really get worry out of our life. And as I go, you're going to recognize different types of worry. But you know what? None of it is okay. None of it is okay. So how do we get worry out of our lives? And remember how I started. I said, it steals your sleep. It robs your joy. It dominates your thoughts. It chokes your faith, which is one of the most serious ones. And it renders us in a state where it then becomes the most important thing in that moment. And so we need to get it out of our life. And the first thing I want to say, you see, I consider worry to be a thief. Does that make sense? And so my first point is stop the robber. You see, it says in Philippians 4, 6, in, in the New Living Translation, it says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything now. I want to give you a really silly example of worry, okay, first, because it says don't worry about anything. So, I'm finishing um, the whole process of my latest book, which is called The Many Faces of Shame. And, and really in my, in my heart, you know when, you, when, when you've worked on something, you've given yourself to it, it, it is like giving birth to a baby. I think... All my books really have been like giving birth to babies. And so, you know, as that thing is about to enter the birth canal, you're feeling really protective over it. You understand? And so we're just reaching the place where this baby is about to be born. How many of you want to read The Many Faces of Shame? I'm telling you, there's something in there for all of us. And um, Tim is always hugely, hugely helpful. So he, um, he with all my books... He has um, proofed and really he, he spends ages looking at the wording and making sure that it's all kind of um, grammatically correct, most powerful expression of each sentence, etc. And, um, 
And so he just finished his um, proofing. And, um, and so I emailed him yesterday. And, you know, thank you so much. And da 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 And then I, I said, you know, I'd love just an overview. Because he, he's, he's very good at giving me writing feedback of how I can improve my writing. And so I said, I'd love to hear. And he replied saying, could we chat about it tomorrow instead? And so I'm suddenly thinking, oh, no. Why does he want to talk? You know when someone wants to talk? When they say, can we talk? Anyone ever said to you, um, look, you and I need to talk. Come on. And you're thinking, why do we need to talk? What, what is it that you need to say that you can't put in writing? You know, this guy writes. So why does he need to talk? And I'm like suddenly going, oh, no. My baby's in the birth canal. I didn't think that. I'm thinking, oh, no, I love this book. Oh, my goodness. I really believe this book is just going to help everyone. Oh, my goodness. What? Why? What have I, oh, dear. Oh, goodness. Is he going to tell me that he thinks the whole, oh, now, let me stop there. What does the Bible say? Don't worry about... Anything. You see, there's certain things that we engage because we think, oh, that's not a big issue. I haven't got an issue with worry, generally. And so someone's saying, I need to have a word, and it's tomorrow, and, and you've now got 24 hours. You see, we've got to make a decision that I'm going to have zero tolerance on worry. And the moment I realized what I was doing, I was like, God, forgive me. And so, you see, let me say something. You see, what does the scripture say? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about... Everything. You see, there are certain things that we say, well, that's too petty to pray. How many of you thought, you know, someone might say, oh... Um, you know, at work, they might say, oh, there's something we need to catch up about. And you're thinking, uh-oh. But that's too petty to pray about. Listen, it's not too petty to pray about if it warrants your worry. You see, if there's even a moment of worry or concern or disquiet or trouble, then we've got to immediately stop the who's called a robber. We've got to stop it. We've got to catch it. And so I got hold of that thing. And you see, this is it. What does the Bible say? Does worry ever help? Yeah. Scripture says, who can add even a cubit to their stature by worrying? You know, you can't change anything by worry. You can't improve or enhance your life by worry. It doesn't ever change anything. Except you wake up looking ugly because you've had no sleep. Sorry, you never look ugly. You always look beautiful and handsome and all those other things. But you see, this is some of the ways that the enemy lies to us. Oh, that's too petty to pray about. If it warrants your worry, it's not too petty to pray about. You need to pray and then deal with the worry. So it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Now, Matthew 6, 34, also in the New Living Translation, says this. I love this. It says, don't worry about tomorrow. Annie once sung a song, didn't she? Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you. You see, the Bible says, don't worry about... Now, what does that tell you? And, and it's interesting why it says it. It says, then in, in, a bit further on in the verse, it says, today's trouble is enough. Now, either you're God and you can handle it all, or you're human, like I am, very human, and we can only handle today's issues. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? You see, Scripture says, don't worry about tomorrow, which tells me tomorrow's, issue are, tomorrow's issues are off limits. They're beyond the, the, the boundaries of what you're allowed to be dwelling on. Are you getting this? If it can't be resolved today, and it's something that is a burden, a care that's about tomorrow, God's saying it's, not, it, it's, it's trespassing. 
You know, it's like, it's like venturing onto someone else's property. God's saying, no, 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 tomorrow's mine. You know, we all say it. You know, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know the one who holds tomorrow. Well, we need to prove that that's the truth in our own lives. Are you hearing me? Tomorrow is off limits. Tomorrow's worries are trespass. And you know, isn't that a, a joy? Because it means all I need to deal with is today. In other words, am I doing the right thing today? Am I in faith today? Am I, am I being obedient today? Am I over this situation, you know, with, with, with my son or daughter or with exams or with a test or with my boss? Am I doing today what God asked me to do today? You see, when we focus on today, um, then, then we're going to, it's much easier to become obedient people, isn't it? Because we've got the headspace for it. We've got the energy for it. So we need to stop the robber. We need to stop that thief from taking us out. You see, we end up being a crim in criminal activity as well. When we stray. Now, the second thing I want to say is, the second thing we need to do is disarm his weapon. Turn to your neighbor and say, put your weapons down. <laughs> and then you can look back at them and say, don't worry, you're not my enemy. <sighs> now, I want you to hear this. Matthew 6, 31, it says this. Do not worry saying. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? To, to try and help you understand this point, I'm just going to share um, something about my own journey recently. You see, you could say, don't worry arguing, don't worry remembering, don't worry thinking about. But saying, you see, we say in our hearts and we say with our lips. Um, this year, one of, one of the things that I have to do on a regular basis, is sign contracts, which sounds like a really lovely thing to do. Oh, just pop your signature here, sign a contract. Now, the reason I have to sign contracts is because for Healed for Life, as a ministry, we rent venues. And every venue has a little price tag attached to it. And no venues are going to say, yes, why not just come and we'll reserve all these rooms for you. If you don't use them, doesn't matter, sweetheart. We'll just let you off. They don't do that, do they? Right. So I have to sign all these contracts. One thing I have never done and I don't intend to do is add up what all the contracts come to together in a year. I've never done that. But I sign a lot of contracts. And I'm signing more because the more we do... In America in particular, then the more contracts I sign. And the more each total contract becomes something I am then responsible, or the ministry is responsible for paying. And so recently, you know, we've, we've had in America, here in the UK, Healed for Life is in an amazing level of a momentum. The courses just fill up. You announce an event and everyone just starts booking and, and we thank God for that. But in America, it's not like that yet. And so, you know, I'll have signed a contract and then an event is coming. And I'm looking at how many rooms I have committed to, contractually obliged to pay for, and how many people have booked. And so... Recent, you know, this year I've got many more contracts that I've signed because we've been extending Healed for Life. It used to be two a year. Um, now, at the moment, I'm signing about six or seven contracts a year in America. And suddenly, I found myself getting more and more weighed down. And signing a contract, and at that moment, you know, there's the faith in the moment, but then there's the fight of faith to maintain it. And they're two very different things. So I, I, rem I remember the first contract I signed in Maryland. And, and they, I'd been handed over the contract, and it was the biggest, most binding contract I'd ever yet been 
um, requested to sign. And, and, and I'm with two of our US team members, and one of them, Joyce, he starts making jokes about the contract. And I turned around to her, I said, look, you do not start joking about this contract until I've brought it to God, laid it before him, made it his. Then we can have fun. But for now, quiet. So you hear what I'm saying? So, so I, I, I suddenly, you know, this year we've had a lot of events where there's been quite a, you know, a real push in prayer and a battle. And so I found myself just in a situation which was in some ways not my norm because I really defeated worry many years ago, many, many years ago. And since then, it's not really been a big battle. And I hadn't recognized all the little battles. But the big ones had been defeated. And so now I'm seeing myself, and I suddenly realized, I remember saying to my husband, saying, wow, I know why God told you not to get involved in Healed for Life. Because God wanted me to grow up. If he was involved, I'd just be like, ah, you handle the finances. And I'd just duck and dive and say, look, I'll, I'll minister to people's hearts, but I'm not going to handle money. You know, um, but God wanted me to grow up. Turn to your neighbor and say, we get to grow with every battle that we win. Amen. So suddenly I found myself and just thinking, gosh, this is so hard oh, this isn't fair, oh my goodness, nobody else knows what this is like, I have to sign all these contracts, no one else has to do that, you know, it's my name on there, and, uh, and, and I was, I remember I was just talking to the Lord, and I was, I, I was actually out on a walk, and as I, I was walking and talking to the Lord, and I remember saying, gosh, Lord, you know, I know I don't normally have an issue with worry, and I'd realized I was now worried, and I said, but you see, God, I, I, it's because I've got a reason, Wow, the moment it came out of my life, I was out of my mouth, I was like, oh! let me explain why. You see, worry manages to really try and find a legitimate place in our hearts when we give it credence. I've got a reason, it's my responsibility to worry. I have staff that I need to pay. I have bills I need to pay. I have a family to provide for. I have a responsibility as a good leader to make sure it works out for them. I have, I have a responsibility as a parent to make sure their lives turn out. I have a responsibility to do my best in these exams, to live this life the way... And in that moment... I suddenly realized, do you remember Jesse Duplantis' message? Do we believe in God or do we believe God? And this is what God said to me. He said, if you believe me, you have no reason. In other words, the moment I think I've got a reason, I'm not believing you know, we all need our chapter and verse that we're standing on, the word, the rhema word that you're using to fight that unique battle with. But you see, if I believe, then there's no reason because God's got this. Are you listening? God's got this. But it goes a step further than that. And I want you to hear this. You see, if I believe, then, then I have no reason to worry because I know that God's going to do it. I know that he'll be faithful to his word. I know when I look back over my life that he's come through every other time. I know that he loves my children more than I do. I know that he wants me to succeed. Are you, are you getting this? I know that he wants to make sure that, you know, I know that he will look after the provision of our household because we're tithers, we're givers. We're fa like, it's, all, it's all good. I believe. But it goes further than that, because then I realized God was saying something else to me. And this almost takes it a step further, because if I believe, there's no reason. Oh, there's that old-fashioned ringtone <laughs> that Sarah talked about. No, not really. It's a wonderful modern one. So if I believe, I've got no right to worry. But listen to this. 
You see, whose are you? Who do you belong to? You know, whatever you do, who is the boss? Yeah? So if you have a family, I mean, they, they, who do they belong to? Now, I really want you to hear this. You see, I suddenly realized a step further than that, which is, if I believe, I have no reason. But if I truly belong, then I have no right to worry. Because it's not mine. If everything that is mine belongs to him, are you getting this? Then when it's his, you see, your life, if it's surrendered to him, it's his life. Your finances, if they're surrendered to him, well, they're his finances. Those bills that land on the door, if, if we're in the will of God, then they're his bills. You see, this ministry that God has asked me to lead, is it my ministry? No, it belongs to him. So if it's his, I have no right to worry. God wants us to stay within the confines of what he's called us to and not move out of that place. So thirdly, we need to give it to God. This is the obvious one. What does it say? 1 Peter 5, 7, in the Amplified, please. It says, casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him. Let me say it again. Casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns. That even includes someone saying, I need to have a word with you. Even includes, you know, when someone calls, they don't get through and they say, it's really important that we catch up as fast as possible. When you hear that message, it includes those ones too. It includes those things that just go on, you know, that, that kind of, gosh, how's this going to work out in the end? Where, where, where is it all going to go? It includes all of them. Say it's all of them. There it is, casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all. But I would add to that, keep doing it until it's gone. Have you got that? Keep casting your cares until you're not carrying them anymore. If you need to do the same things daily or three times a day until the weight has lifted completely, then keep doing it until you know that you're not carrying it anymore. And then finally, change the record. Let me explain. So number one, stop the robber. Disarm his weapon. Give it to God and change the record. How many of you remember the days of vinyls? It can't be just Tottenham Pete because I'm sorry, sorry, but I'm not as old as you. Ne I mean, maybe nearly. Come on, if you remember the days of vinyls, put up your hand. If you remember the days of records, those round records that you put on a LPs and singles. Come on, wave at me. Come on, shame the devil and tell the truth. <laughs> Darius does not remember. He's far too young. Far too young, yeah. So you must be about 25, I think. Yes, just about, he says. Okay. Okay, well, you see, we need to change the record. Let me explain. You see, worry speaks, and we speak it. What am I going to do? How is it going to work out? When is it going to turn around? What's the outcome going to be? How am I going to handle it if this? What am I going to do if that? Worry speaks, so we need to speak back. Turn to your neighbor and say, speak back. Yeah. And let me say something else. Speak out loud. Speak out loud. Don't just think back. Because when we speak, it has more power than when we just think. And you see, if the enemy comes at you by tormenting your thoughts, you come back at him by tormenting him with your words. We need to change the record. But let me tell you the record that we need to play. And Chris shared it with us. We need to play a record that is going round and round and round saying, my God is so good. My God is always faithful. Thank you, Lord, for every time you've come through. Thank you, Lord, that you're bigger than the things that are bigger than me. Thank you, Lord. You know, when you start giving thanks... 
before you've even seen the outcome. Suddenly faith is going to arise on the inside. You're going to know God's got this. Philippians 4, 6. We'll go back there again. Be anxious for nothing. Now make this a declaration. Say, Heavenly Father, in everything, I will pray. I will not worry. I will pray. And then it says here, with thanksgiving. You see, the thanksgiving, it's exactly, you see, all the time we're battling with it. So when you're casting your cares, I want you to see it like this. We're fighting. Ron Kay, let me, let me borrow you because I know I can fight with her and she won't get hurt. <laughs> so you see, worry throws us a punch. Ooh. And you see, when we're casting the care and when we're stopping the robber and we're saying, I'm not going to do that, we're fighting back. And then that worry tries to come in another way. And, and, and thoughts are perturbing and so we speak back. But we're fighting on the same level. Let me tell you the moment that you move. And you say, I'm moving into gratitude. We are on a higher level. And suddenly, she cannot. When she tries to come at me, boof, she's over. You got the picture. You see, when you get into gratitude, you pull yourself out of that pit, of that place where your thoughts are perturbing, where you're still saying, but God, how? How do I really cast this care? Because you throw it at him, and then the devil throws a new one back. You throw it at him, and then you say, Satan, I've got one on you. I've got this weapon called praise, called gratitude, and it turns the thing around. I want to ask you to stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just shut your eyes in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, the beginning of transformation is always truth. And for some of you right now, worry will have been a huge burden, will have been weighing you down. For others, maybe you realize, I've just entertained little niggles. And you know, when those little niggles come, you can write off 24 hours of your life. So right now, with your eyes shut, if you realize that you've been entertaining any level of worry in any guise whatsoever, just lift up both hands high. And right now, just say to the Lord, Heavenly Father, I ask for your help. Help me to be aware every time I worry. I choose today to have zero tolerance on every concern, on every anxiety, on any time I'm disquieted or troubled and now just say to the Lord I cast all my cares onto you Lord Jesus because you care more than I ever could Father I believe therefore I have no reason to worry Father, I belong to you. My life is yours. So I have no right. I give it all to you. And now I want you from your own heart to spend a minute just giving God thanks. I want you to thank him in the exact areas where you've been worried. I want you to thank him for what he's done until this point. I want you to thank him for how he's never left you. He's never forsaken you. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that all my life you've been faithful. Father, thank you that you're so, so good. Father, thank you that there's nothing that we are contending with that you haven't already got a plan for. Father, I thank you 
that you are able to turn it all around for our good. Thank you, Lord, that you are able to turn it all around for our good. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory. You know, let me say one more thing. You know, when there's no big test, no big battle, no big fight, there's no big testimony. When it all comes in the way we want it, when we want it, how we want it, there's no growth. But when we have to depend on God, and when we say, God, I trust you enough to let you do it your way. You know, sometimes I would love it if God did it my way so that I don't have to trust. I don't have to have faith, but he wants to be able to do it his way. So right now with your hands raised, just say, Heavenly Father, do it your way. Do it your way, Lord, so that you will get all the glory. Now give him a shout of praise.